You know, we make a lot of decisions and choices every day and all year. And I just want to say thank you for making the decision to be here together in the church, to worship God, to learn, to grow. Thank you for doing that. And for those of you who are joining us online, we think about you as well. Thank you for joining us online too. For There's a lot of sicknesses right now. There's uh, a lot of circumstances where people can't be here because they get off at work at 10 or something like that or 11. So we're just grateful you can join us online and be here today. It seriously is an important decision, isn't it? To pour and abide, abide in God and let him pour into you. And last week we talked about abiding in Christ. And this is kind of really a piggyback message onto that because I want to share with you what happens when we abide in Christ is we get godly direction. We get godly direction for him or from him. And I looked up some, I wanted to know, like, how many decisions do we make a day? So I looked up some statistics, and there was one statistic that kept coming up, and it was that we make 35,000 choices or decisions a day. Now, I'm not sure how they figured that out. I don't even know if I want to know the process. I, whoever had to count their decisions all day, wow. It's an estimated time, uh, amount. Can you imagine counting your decision for an entire day? I just decided to make this decision to decide to make that decision. That's four. <laughs> Cornell University said that we make on average 226, 226 decisions just on food alone. Isn't that wild? Just on me, 500. But 226, <laughs> uh, so. that's a lot of decisions. And when I think about, uh, when people come to me looking for advice, or especially students, I was a youth pastor here for 11 years, and I was working with, I've been working with college age, I still like to hang out with them as well, and, and young adults, we have a young adult group, by the way, on Tuesdays, if you're not aware, this is a shameless plug, seven o'clock community center. Youth group, seven o'clock Wednesday nights. But uh, anyway, I love them, I love hanging out with them, and one of the decisions, are mul multiple times, most of the time, the major conversation people have with me, the young students especially, is decisions. The topic of making important decisions in their lives. But I'm 36, I'm making important decisions all the time. So I really feel like this message is so important for us that we need godly direction in our lives. Can I get an amen? amen? Now, I don't want you to have any kind of direction. I think you need to have godly direction so important for us as believers. If you're seeking God today, I pray that you are encouraged by this message. Psalm 37 is where God took me on making decisions. And so if you have your Bibles, go to that. If you want to use your phones, you know, Google Psalm 37, New Living Translation or NLT. That's where we're going to hang out today. And I got to tell you, there is, there's this thing in, in pastoral leadership that says, you know, be careful about reading an entire chapter on Sunday mornings and, and covering an entire chapter. I gotta say, I'm a rebel. I feel like you need the entire chapter sometimes. And I could care less what studies say about what people need and stuff like that. We just need the Bible. Um, and I'm, I mean, I do care what studies say because we just said 35,000 decisions were made daily. But what I'm saying is there is nothing wrong with reading an entire chapter of the Bible in church, all right? You can clap if you want to clap. It's all good. So we're going to read an entire chapter from Psalms because you know what we're doing right now? We're actually practicing abiding together, together as a corporate body in God, fellowshipping with him, learning from him. We've worshiped, we've prayed, we've reflected on some things. Now we're going to read the Bible and reflect on more. So today, I've already prayed for today that God fills you as you fellowship with him in his word, that he feeds you what you need today, okay? And even for me, again, as I read, so Psalm 37, we're going to find a lot of direction in this chapter, and let's, let's read it together, but I'm going to hone in on Psalm 37, 4, after we're done reading. It says this, Don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong, for like grass they soon fade away, like spring flowers they soon wither. Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, 
and he will help you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn, and the justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Stop being angry. Turn from your rage. Do not lose your temper. It only leads to harm. He's saying here, don't be mad at those who are wicked. For the wicked will be destroyed, but those who trust in the Lord will possess the land. Soon the wicked will disappear. Though you look for them, they will be gone. The lowly will possess the land and will live in peace and prosperity. The wicked plot against the godly. They snarl at them in defiance, but the Lord just laughs, for he sees their day of judgment coming. The wicked draw their swords and string their bows to kill the poor and the oppressed, to slaughter those who do right, but their swords will stab their own hearts and their bows will be broken. Let me just take a moment real quick because you're like, what in the world is this context saying? Like, this is David. And David was in fierce battle all the time, it, it seems like, when he was a king. And he was, he was betrayed. There was people trying to usurp his authority and take his throne. He was uh, chased by uh, King Saul. He was trying to kill him. So David knows very well what it's like to be attacked by his enemies and wicked people. It appears that they are prosperous and doing fine. And meanwhile, things may not be going well for him, and he's doing good. So this is the context that's a little different than it is here in America, right? So it's important that we understand that, but we're supposed to be able to derive things from it. But I will say this, if you are a persecuted Christian right now in China, you probably can relate to this really well. If you were in Iran right now, Iran, there's a, there's a movement going on in Iran, and you could be killed for being found out that you are a follower of Christ. There's a movement in Korea, there's a movement in Indonesia, India, all around the world, there's a move of God. Africa, we just saw that that African pastor was murdered this past week. He was persecuted and killed, okay? So this is real for some people, all right? And, and for us, it's a little different, but that's the context from what David was saying. Verse 16 says, it is better to be godly and have little than to be evil and rich. For the strength of the wicked will be shattered, but the Lord takes care of the godly. Day by day, the Lord takes care of the innocent, and they will receive an inheritance that lasts forever. They will not be disgraced in hard times. Even in famine, they will have more than enough. I think Sam was saying that in our worship time. God's got you. He's more than enough for you. But the wicked will die. The Lord's enemies are like flowers in a field. They will disappear like smoke. The wicked borrow and never repay, but the godly are generous givers. Those the Lord blesses will possess the land, but those he curses will die. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Isn't that interesting? Wow. <clears throat> Hold on a second. Psalm 37, 4 says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. Psalm 37, 23 says, The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. There's a mutual delighting in one another, isn't there? And God cares about the details of your life. That's direction verse right there. Though they stumble, though the godly may stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. Once I was young and now I'm old, yet I have never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread. In fact, you ready? The godly always give generous loans to others and their children are a blessing. And church, I think that's such an important lesson for us that to be generous because it shows the generosity of God in our lives, his faithfulness and his love. Help others in need. Help others in need. Be generous to those who do not have much. And that's what Calvary strives to be in our community. Verse 27, turn from evil and do good and you will live in the land forever. For the Lord loves justice and he will never abandon the godly. He will keep them safe forever, but the children of the wicked will die. The godly will possess the land and will live there forever. The godly offer good counsel. They teach right from wrong. They have made God's law their own, so they will never slip from his path. Another direction verse there. The wicked wait in ambush for the godly, looking for an excuse to kill them, but the Lord will not let the wicked succeed or let the godly be condemned when they are put on trial. Put your hope in the Lord. Travel steadily along his path, direction. 
He will honor you by giving you the land. You will see the wicked destroyed. I have seen wicked and ruthless people flourishing like a tree in his native soil. But when I looked again, they were gone. Though I searched for them, I could not find them. Look at those who are honest and good, for a wonderful future awaits those who love peace. But the rebellious will be destroyed. They have no future. The Lord rescues the godly. He is their fortress in times of trouble. The Lord helps them, rescuing them from the wicked. He saves them, and they find shelter in him. <clears throat> wow. David is writing this psalm from experience, obviously, of much tension of being a godly person and dealing with wicked people and, and nations around him. And again, this is Old Testament. So this is before Jesus came. And I would tell you, I want the church, I want you to understand something. And those of you who may be seeking, going, wow, here we go. Once again, the church is talking about versus us versus them. That's not the tone of the, of the word of God altogether. It's not an us versus them mentality. When Jesus came, he made another way. It's, it's now what we call the day of grace or the season of grace. Where Jesus actually instructs us to pray for our enemies and love them. But the reality is at this time in David's life, he was being constantly attacked. His Israelites were being constantly attacked. And so there was a season where there had to be self-defense. There was a season where they had to protect themselves. And David was under great attack. And it just seemed like he couldn't win. It seemed like, you know, for him, he wasn't winning at this season in his life. This is actually a really powerful psalm for us who recognize the frustrating reality that it appears that the good guys finish last and that the bad guys tend to always be prosperous. It, life seems unfair. or If you feel like you've always finished last, even when you're living for God, this psalm is perfect for you. But you ready for this? So is Psalm 73. And I think it's kind of funny. It's the same. It's the numbers reversed. So Psalm 37 and then Psalm 73 talks about the same thing and how God still is going to take care of his people. So if you're any, any, any of our friends in here are dyslexic, it works out perfect for you, you'll land on one of them, and you'll be good. My dad's dyslexic, so I can, I can make a joke about that. He jokes with me about it all the time. I'm, I'm thinking I might be in that direction. I think I might be, because I, I saw Psalm 73 earlier when I was preaching. David is clear. That those who are godly, they're in the right direction, and the end is good. Those who are wicked, the direction is not good. It, it, it's temporary. And so it's not a good direction to go into. So what is the meaning of Psalm 37.4? Because it's, it's nestled in here, and it's a powerful verse. And, and what does it have to do with direction? Because it says this, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. Now, at first glance, first of all, this is a, a very famous quoted uh, verse, so I really want to take time on this to help apply it to us when it comes to direction. And at first glance, it seems like this is an awesome verse, and, and at the same time, it seems a little risky because man sometimes has some really interesting desires, and sometimes they're really wicked, right? Right? And so will God really give us our heart's desires? What about the wicked ones? Well, it's obvious, right, that he won't answer those. But here's the thing. For someone who may be new to the faith or don't understand this, uh, we can kind of come to God and expect anything to be answered only to find out he's not that vending machine we hope for. So I want to make sure we understand this scripture. It also used to bother me a little bit when I would hear the line, just follow your heart. I don't think that's something we should say lightly because I've seen what mankind's heart can do in people's lives. I've seen their desires. I've even seen my own at times. And they're not always that great, are they? So maybe it's not a good idea to necessarily say that. Now, if someone is transformed by God and God is living in their heart, that's a different story. So what is God saying you should do? What is the desires that God has planted in you? Because that may be the right direction to go in. Proverbs 21, 2 says this. A person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. At church, I would, I, you know how I take that verse? I may think that I know the right way, 
but I better double check with what God says. I, I need to check. I feel a certain way, but feelings isn't always truth. You know what I'm saying? It's not always truth. It's not always the I feel like I should do this. What does God feel like we should do? And what does God say we should do? So it's obvious that God doesn't grant every desire. So how does this verse work? Take delight in the Lord comes first for good reason. Because in the Hebrew, the words delight yourself means to be soft and pliable like clay. And so if we delight ourselves in God, he's going to shape and mold our hearts. As we abide in fellowship in his word, he's going to shape our pliable, soft hearts. And this is why we see in the Bible many times that God confronts the Israelites and others because they have hard hearts. They're not coming to him with pliable, soft hearts. They're coming to him with hard hearts. The prophets were frustrated because they would share a word from God and, they, and the people of God, the people that God chose, would not receive the word because they hardened their hearts. You know why? They weren't delighting in God. They were delighting in their idols and the things of that world. Then it says this, because this is where the verse starts to make sense. The first part of the verse says, take delight in the Lord. The second part says, and he will give your heart's desires. What happens is as we're in the fellowship of God, as we delight in him, he works on our hearts and his desires become our desires. Your heart will begin to change. It's really simple in a way. If you think about it, he works on your heart and then he gives you a new perspective and he even gives you a new ask like a new request, a new perspective, a new direction in life. You know, it makes really sense, too, if you think about it. When someone got saved, didn't you notice a real difference in their life? They took a new direction. They took a 180 because their heart was changed. Because God got a hold of their heart, they went in a whole new direction. And you could see it. You could see the fruit. I love what John 15 said, uh, 7 said. We, said. we read this last week. And I wanted to explain this verse because I wanted to connect it because I read it last week and it makes complete sense when you put it in this context. John 15, 7 says, But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Again, we can read that and go, Oh, God's a vending machine. I can get anything I want. No, it's so important that we read the first part. If you remain in me, and you ready for this? And my words remain in you. See what's happening here? We, our hearts can't change without being in God and having his word in our hearts. Our hearts will struggle to be and go in the right direction if God's word isn't stored up in our hearts. We need God's word to shape our desires. It is going to be really hard to do what God wants you to do if you don't know what God wants you to do. It's going to be really hard to know anything if you don't know God. And so the Word of God gives us a chance to know. Here's a side note. LifeWay Research in 2017 did a study on discipleship in churches, and they found out that the number one spiritual discipline in a church for any believer to help them grow, to live the life that they should live following Jesus was to read the Bible. The number one spirit, prayer is so important too. It's right up there. By the way, I've been doing a new thing where I've been praying as I read the Bible. It is fun. If I read something that hits me, I stop and pray about it. You don't have to have a cookie cutter prayer life. You're like, okay, I read 15 minutes. Now I'll sit down and pray for 15 minutes. God is bigger than that. If you feel like you need to stop and pray after you read a verse and go, God, help me apply this, and then you forget where you are, who cares? Go with it. That's what's been happening in my life. It's awesome. Now, of course, I have the Bible marked right in front of me, so I know where to go next. But I forgot to finish my devotions this past week because I got caught up in prayer over what I read. You know what? That was an awesome abiding experience in his presence. It's cool. They said that in this study, those who read, studied, and applied themselves to the Bible were more likely to live out the Christian life than those who didn't. So what an important decision this year to make sure we read it. Again, though, why is Psalm 37.4 nestled in the middle of a wisdom psalm 
about the destiny of the wicked and godly. It's so, it's such a, it just seems like it's out of place. And why am I making a point to find direction and fellowship with God in his word? It's because I see a connection when you consider Proverbs 4, 23. Proverbs 4, 23. What does it say? It says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. See, what I see here is, is that we need to guard our hearts from focusing on what the wicked world is doing and achieving and accomplishing, and it appears to be successful. And what can happen is we can want to delight in the world too. If we see it, we become envious. The first line he says is, do not worry or be envious of the wicked. So what can happen is, is if we look at the world, we can become a little drawn to it. If we focus and compare the success of the, of the wicked world compared to what we find in God, we can be drawn to it. And now our heart is really has one foot in the world and one foot in God. Our heart can be directed, it can be influenced by what we're seeing. Did not Sam also say, it's, it, it's, God is speaking again this week before I even get to preach. We're, we're affirming what Sam said with scripture today. We're affirming what he was saying today. That we must not live by sight, but by faith. Because Psalm 37 is someone living by sight, and so therefore they start delighting in the world, but we must live by faith and delight in the God we cannot see. But we can see his word, and his word has been everlasting, and it has proven true for thousands of years. They cannot destroy the validity of the scripture. The, the smartest people in the world have tried to question the scripture and they end up getting saved. How about that? That's for a whole other series. It's important that we guard our heart because it determines the course of our life. So what do we feed it? What do we give it? What are we delighting in? Psalm 119. I want to go to that. Psalm 119, 105. Be on the screen for you. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. Now watch these next verses. And I think I have them there for you. The wicked have set their traps for me, but I will not turn from your commandments. Your laws are my treasure. They are my heart's delight. The laws here can mean the word of God, scripture. I am determined to keep your decrees to the very end. Wow. Direction. Look at the word heart comes up again. How important it is that we guard our heart, that we think about our heart. Again, Psalm 37, 4, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. As we delight in God, our desires become his desires. Therefore, we will ask anything in his name and it will be granted. In other words, our heart will ask something that God would want us to ask. And then we'll go in a direction that God wants us to go. So I need to share something that's just been brewing in me for a while. Because making decisions in this life is so important. Right? I mean, there's some major decisions going on in your life this week, isn't there? And sometimes there's ones we don't even think. We just do it. Default decision, default response. There's actually a lot of psychology behind that. We don't realize how many default decisions we make. We don't even think about it. We just do it. Hopefully a lot of them for the teenagers is you wear deodorant. You know what I mean? We need you to wear deodorant. Get up, put on deodorant. I used to tell that to the youth all the time, especially the boys in our bunks during summer camp. Ooh, man. Default decision, brother. Get up, put on some deodorant. That is a big decision when you're in there for a week and the clothes start smelling and all that. Whoo. Man, that's bringing back some bad memories. Let's, let's move on. <laughs> okay, real quick, real quick story. This kid wore the same pair of socks for an entire week. He took them off and hung them up on the rack next to my bed. I woke up in the middle of the night. I was like, what is that awful smell? <laughs> it was terrible. That was a bad decision on his part. I love them, but man, that was a bad decision. So, 
Be wise about your direction in life, where you're headed. Guard your heart is what I'm saying. But can I ask you some questions and some things to think about that I think about, about making decisions and before I make decisions? I would highly encourage you to not make any major decisions without abiding in God first and having quality time with him. Because of everything I'm preaching right now. Because your heart is being directed either by God or yourself and the things of this world. And so you want to go in the right direction. So how is your abiding time? How is your prayer and devotional time, the reading the Bible, the listening? Am I getting godly direction from his word? Here's a question I ask myself. How's my track record lately? Have I been off? Have some of my decisions been a little off and, and I was wrong? Maybe I shouldn't make that next big decision then until I've sought God's face on it. What will the impact be on those around me, starting with my own family, starting with those who I work with, those who I'm my neighbors, whoever? Here's a big one. Does it glorify God when I'm about to make the decision I'm about to make? Does it bring glory to God or does it hurt God? Here's another one. Am I still confused or do I have peace about moving forward? I mean, these are questions that I have for people when they come to me and they ask for direction in their life, which is one of the top topics I get come across my email or, or in-person conversations. Or they're getting ready to make a decision. And that's a question I have is, do you feel at peace or do you still have confusion about what you should do next? If you have confusion about, if you're, if you're here to meet with me, there could be a, a good chance that you're looking for confirmation or you're still confused. And so maybe we shouldn't rush into that next decision. Is my decision in God's word, can I find it in God's word anywhere? Because there's a lot of things that the Bible covers and there's a lot of things that the Bible doesn't cover. But the principles are there. Like for one thing, the Bible may not talk about a certain subject, but the question I have is, does it glorify God what you're about to do? So it may not answer it, but the Bible does say to glorify, to glorify God in everything you say or do. To do it unto him. Talked about that in the first message of the series. Ready for this? Have I fasted and prayed? Have I cleared out all the noise and all the voices around me? All the stuff that's given me their opinions. My goodness, I was on Facebook this week. I read so many wise sayings that I was confused at what I should do next in my life. That's a joke, but you know what I mean. There is so many things in front of us telling us what to do. I mean, this, this, this sermon is so important right now because I'm online and, and I'm being told that there's going to be seven different things that happen to me by tomorrow if I don't drink enough water or something like that. And, you know, I'm just like, good grief. There's so many smart people online and they're confusing me. <laughs> what I'm saying is, is don't take your advice and direction from social media. Now, I'm going to go full circle and kind of like almost sound like I'm contradicting what I'm saying. But I'm saying this should be one of our last resorts because I think that God can direct you as, as, as much as God will direct you. If we wait long enough, God will give you direction. That's why it's said in verse 8, be still and wait patiently on God. Might have been verse 7, my bad. Point is. Then after we've done all that, here's a question. Have I sought the counsel of men or women who pray, who are in their word, and here's the one that's really fun, who are honest with me? See, if I need help from man, I'm going to go to people who are going to be honest with me. People who love me enough to tell me the truth. And a lot of times, they're probably going to use scripture. You know what a lot of those people do when they counsel me? They say, what is God telling you to do? I'm like, oh, man. I was trying to get an answer from you. If I wait long enough, God's going to leave me. He's going to work on my desires. See, if it's the wrong desire, he's going to tweak it as I hang out with him. I mean, this is Psalm 37.4 applied right now that maybe we should wait upon the Lord and wait in his presence long enough for his 
for him to change our hearts. And then we trust what our heart is definitely feeling compelled to do. And does it honor God? Does it love those around me? Is it confirmed with those who counsel me? Listen, the best thing you can do is surround yourself with people who pray and fast and read the word. And if you don't know anyone like that, start finding people like that here in the church because they're here. Okay, young people, I absolutely love being surrounded by my elders. They have so much wisdom. I want to encourage you to not make a judgment based on what you see. Yes. And I will have to say this, elders, our elders, those who have been before us, who are wise, our young people are on fire for God too. And they will, they will inspire you to go after God in ways you've never seen before. They have so much energy, so much passion for God's word. But we need each other is what I'm saying. We need each other. We do need that godly counsel in our lives. So what's our takeaways today? Well, there's already been a ton, hasn't there? But we've been abiding, doing devotions together, so to say. I don't know if you noticed that, but we've been studying Psalm 37. And we've been studying other verses and what they mean. So I just showed you guys what I do on a regular basis every day with God. And I take not down notes. And here's the notes that I took down as I was reading the Bible this week. You ready? Here's the first one. Our hearts can be directed. Choose wisely who or what we let direct them. Our hearts can be directed. Choose wisely who or what we let direct them. I wrote that down in my journal. Just from reading Psalm 37, reading these other verses. Secondly, we won't find godly direction from an evil world, but you will find it in fellowship with God. Our world's confused right now. The last thing I want to do is be more confused. And I don't mean that with judgment. I just mean that in sincerity and honesty. It's confusing what I'm supposed to do next with water. There's so many studies being done. One, one year, I wasn't supposed to drink a lot of milk. The next year, if I, if I don't, I die of this or that. You know, it's just like, what? I'm confused. I'm being serious, actually. I read two different studies and didn't know what to do. God's word is godly direction. And I want to be a godly person, so I like God's word. You're going to make thousands of decisions every day. Make the vital decision to have God's word fill and direct your heart today and tomorrow and the next day. If it's true that we get 35,000 decisions a day, roughly, shouldn't one of them be, I'm going to hang out with God today. I'm going to abide in him. It's so beneficial. Why? Because your heart is at stake. The course of your life and direction in your life is at stake. And God loves to speak to people. It's not like he's trying to hide himself. He actually wants to. Again, I said it last week. We just have to slow down long enough to find out that he was patiently waiting for us. And then this is important. It goes with Psalm 37. Delighting in God takes the shine out of this world. I love that song. The things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. As we abide in God, the things of this world become just less interesting because we find true treasure in his presence. Don't dwell on, don't dwell on or envy the prosperity of the wicked. It's only temporary. And I want to make a comment about this because uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he says to love your enemies and help them, I think as we delight in God, we'll actually not see their prosperity. As we hang out with God, follow me here, okay? This really hit me this week. As we hang out with God, our focus won't be so much on their prosperity. Our focus will be on their souls and their destiny. Like, I could care less how amazing my neighbor's stuff is and, and all the things I got going for them. And by the way, I got to be careful. I'm not judging them. Just because you're successful doesn't mean you're not a believer in God. 
it may mean that you've been generous and been blessed by God. Because we just read that God blesses the generous in Psalm 37. Amen. Amen. You know what it says? You know what basically what we should do? Is we shouldn't even worry about whether that person is, is successful or not. We should just pray for them. And we shouldn't even focus on them as much as we should focus on God. But we should see the wicked and have the right heart because that's what Jesus did. And Jesus prayed and was concerned for their souls. And so he would love on them and teach them the truth. And he would be there for them no matter what their success was. See, Jesus focused on the rich and the poor. He didn't show favorites. He didn't discriminate. So let's not dwell on or envy the prosperity of the wicked. It's only temporary. And here's the other one that goes with that. This is what I wrote down in my journal. The success of the wicked is not success to God. What we define as success, we, we got to be real careful because God defines it differently. Because it might, it might be successful to have a bunch of things here, but what does the Bible say in Matthew? What good is it for man to gain the whole world yet lose his soul? Because we need God. So church, I want to encourage you not to focus on the prosperity of anyone, but to focus on God. To find the success and delight in God and the prosperity of knowing God. You know what the prosperity of knowing God is? Eternal life. Eternal life to enjoy all that he has for you for the next life. To not be burdened by all the things of this world. Maybe this is for someone today because I did not plan to say this, but... Maybe we got caught up so much on all the things we want in this world that we're not even able to enjoy what we have. And we're going to live an entire life not enjoying what we've already been given, how blessed we've been given. And God wants you to enjoy this life. He wants you to enjoy him. And he's got an amazing life for you. My wife and I were talking to our kids last night about this. Do you know what the Bible says the streets of heaven are made out of? Gold. We're going to be walking on gold. There's people being killed to get gold. We're going to be walking on it. That means that value of gold is a lot less. There's going to be so much. Oh, man, there's going to be, there's going to be some nice stuff up there. <laughs> but there's only going to be one reason why it shines. Because God's up there. Isn't that cool? Because it wouldn't even shine without his light. Man. I need to hurry up. Here we go. Two more things. This is, this is for someone in this place. And this is for someone watching. I, don't, this was, I could not get this off my chest this week. I was like, how does this even fit God? And I get how it fits. You are not overlooked. God sees you. You feel like there's injustice. You feel like, you know, God isn't there for you. That's just not true. You feel like the bad guy is always winning and you're not. It's not true. God sees the injustice. If there's truly injustice in your life, God sees it. And he is going to take care of you. He's going to provide for you. He's going to help you. Amen. God is good. God is good. And bottom line, your desires and direction are determined by what you delight in. Your desires and direction are determined by what you delight in. If you delight in God, the direction you're going in is going to be incredible. It's going to be awesome. Can we bow our heads, close our eyes for a moment here after you're done writing that down? <laughs> I sense that a response is needed today, even though I went too long. I'm sorry. Maybe I shouldn't be sorry. It's God. It's his time. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> With your head bowed, your eyes closed, just so you can focus on you and God. God's calling you back home. You've been going in the wrong direction today. 
He wanted you to hear the end game for those who decide to not follow him, to show you your destiny, your future doesn't look good. And he wants you home. He loves you. He sees what you've been through. You're not overlooked. He's been waiting all along. You give your heart to him. You delight in him. You're going to see a whole different destiny and future. And you need to know something, because I would be a bad pastor if I didn't tell you, that there will still be struggles and trials, because that's the other part of the gospel. And it's in the Bible. And that you cannot grade your journey based on prosperity or not. Because prosperity looks different in the eyes of God. As long as he's with you, you prosper. No matter how much is in your bank account, no matter how many good or bad things happen in your life, you cannot determine your destiny on your prosperity here on earth. It's in God. Delight yourself in God. He's going to change your heart. You probably have been saying, I can't change my heart. Man, that is one of the first things you said right, right? You can't. God changes your heart. Right now, ask God to change your heart. To give you a heart that wants him. And to go with him and follow him in his direction. God, we ask that today. All of us in this room need that. God, help me to want everything that you want, not what I want. God, change our church and our friends and those who are seeking today to desire what you have for them. God, thank you that on your path, it's going to be prosperous. We're going to be good. You're taking care of us. And that we don't determine on things, we don't determine success by what we see and those around us. We fix our eyes on you. God, thank you for changing the course of lives today in this service, for changing destinies today with this one simple prayer that says, I follow you and nothing else. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. We love you, God. Help us to apply this message by hanging out with you and letting your word direct our lives. We give you all the glory and praise for our journey. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. God is good. Have a blessed Sunday.